This is uh, Ryan Rizicki, aka The Bruiser. You're watching Johnny Pro Show. The Bruiser, Ryan Rizicki, ranked number one WBC. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Now, I gotta say, congrats on number one ranked WBC. How does that make you feel? Who's the champion? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Who's the yeah. champion? The WBC final eliminator is this Saturday, correct? Yeah. From obviously Nova Scotia, your hometown. It's going to be in Sydney against Duro Dola. Yeah. Now, how does that similar styles of you and him like just go together? How do you think this fight's going to plan out? He's going to be over quick. For I, sure. I think the fight's going to be over maybe the first round. And obviously, you're on a six win win streak, correct? Yeah. And he's on a seven win streak, so it's like right there. So potentially, if you do win, you see a title shot March, I'm guessing? Uh, that's what they're saying, March. That's yeah. what they're saying. Yeah. But how's the training camp going so far? Um, I've honestly, like, for me, it's I train 365 days a year. There's no really training camp for me. It's just yeah. I stay ready all the time. Um, but I've I've been in the gym now since the beginning of summer, so I've been going hard since the beginning of summer. I had two fights, uh, including a North American title fight. So like I'm ready as I could ever be. Do you think it's gonna be like? Is it a perfect match for you? Like similar styles? How does the styles of both you guys? Absolutely, because um, number one, he's a little older, so his legs are. You know, father time, you can't you can't beat father time. So the first thing to go on a fighter is the legs. Yes. Everybody knows that. The, look, Muhammad Ali is a good example. Sugar Ray Robinson is a good example. So movers usually are the first guys to slow down, but that's not what Duradol is. He's a plant his feet, come forward kind of guy. So I don't really got to worry about him not being there to hit. He's going to be there to hit, and that's why I'm saying first round. <sighs> And now this is a homecoming for you, basically. It's such a huge fight. Now, how does it feel like? Uh, is there pressure for you going home and fighting at home? I mean, there's, yeah, there's, there's always going to be a little pressure home. Um, but hey, what, what better, what better place to kill or kill a man or be killed than right in your own there, backyard? In your backyard. <laughs> exactly. Bury me there. Now, your last fight was versus Green. Versus Green, like, how was that? Were you happy with your performance? I wasn't boxing as much as I could have been because I, I really wanted to kill that man. I, <laughs> he said some things before the fight, and it bothered me. It really got to me. So, you know, my whole thing in that fight was just like just murder the guy and and uh, I kind of neglected my boxing skills because I was so focused on just you know punishing him and, and, and just walking through him that I, I got hit a little bit too much so this fight I'm going to uh, try to sit back a little more and even though I'm still going to try to knock him out in the first round I'm going to try to do it a little bit more like strategically. Like people love hearing this story like especially I think you told me like, you hit him with a left and right like broke his ribs and so can you explain that story to people that know because this is quite interesting this is crazy. Yeah that was my uh, third professional fight so it was the first one it was actually the first big fight in Cape Breton in like 40 years so wow. that that was um, that was the first professional fight card there in years so I, I was headlining it and uh, they wanted to bring in a pretty good a solid opponent for me they didn't want to bring in any pushover so I fought the uh, champion, the champion of Slovakia. Wow. I can't remember his record, but he's a good fighter. And, and uh, I studied him leading up to the fight, and I noticed uh, that he liked to leave his elbows real high. He was a mover, he moved left and right, and kind of left his elbows up high. So I, I knew as soon as I jabbed him to the body, he would have to stop. And when I saw the, it came in the first round, and I saw the moment, and I, I jabbed his body, and he stopped. And I just everything I had, I threw the right hand to the body and left hook to the body, and the the right hook. Uh, split his spleen and like r ripped it into two and then the left hook fractured four ribs and they punctured his lung so he like it was the fight was over immediately it was just done done and, and uh, his, him and his his team they only spoke his language so after the fight was over they were trying to explain to the commissioner and the ringside doctors that there's something wrong with the with the fighter because I think immediately he was like bleeding out of his mouth like, wow. coming from the inside like internal bleeding internal that's bleeding. crazy yeah so um they were going to send him on the flight back home the next morning and he ended up missing his flight and uh, they, they, there was something wrong with the guy so they, they finally got him to the hospital and found out that his, his organs were pretty much destroyed. What is your most memorable fight to date? I mean the, the last fight was, was one of them for yeah, sure. Yeah, laid him out. Yeah, I had, I had a, lot, a lot of great fights. I had the fight against Oscar Rivas for the world championship. That was, you know, that was, yeah, that was a really heavy duty fight for sure. That was a crazy fight. I gave up pretty much every advantage I could in that fight but still and you know, I walked out with a career ahead of me, and he he never fought again. Wow, but that and that sure did put your name on a pedestal for sure. Yeah. that was like a slugfest, hundred percent. He was one of my favorite fighters to this day. He's, he's on my list of like one of my favorite fighters. And usually, you get to fight like basically one of your favorites. That's like yeah. a surreal moment for sure. Like, what are your similar styles to you and Jack Dempsey? Do you see? Uh, like he he was a you know the first boxer that I ever actually watched uh, on tape fight, and when I saw him right away, like. 
I kind of got creeped out because I was like, he kind of looks like me. His head is shaped like mine. Like, he's built similar. We have the same stats, height, weight, everything. So it was, it was kind of weird. And then the way he moved, like naturally, when I started boxing, I, I moved the same way naturally. I got low in my legs. I like to bob, bob and weave with my head, come up with the left hook. So like everything that he did, I just kind of did it naturally. So I just kind of like tried to emulate his style right from the, right from the gate. And then not only that, but but the mindset, like Dempsey, if you read his book or you know killer. anything about it, he's a killer. Yeah. He, he he always talks about that in, in his books and you know, he actually had a circus act a lot of people don't know about. Oh, and wow. like and he had said, I, I read this or I can't remember if I read it or someone had told me, but um Chad, the, his circus act was he, he basically boxed with guys off the street. And the and the thing was was if they could last a minute with him he they would get like a thousand dollars and he and somebody had interviewed him i just can't remember i read this but someone had interviewed him about it like his circus act this was when he was heavyweight so, champion of the world too. and it was like he was more disappointed if he couldn't break their skull inside of a minute than he would be if he had to get them a thousand dollars no way what a mentality that's the kind of guy he was so you know to the public he was known as a gentleman wore dressed up nice shake everybody's hands you know do um stuff with the kids and you know like a people person yeah. But I know what well, he once really it goes was. in that once it goes fight time, it's it's yeah. kill or be killed. Wow. Yeah. What does Jack mean to you? I think he's a the guy. I, I know it sounds crazy, but I believe that. And and I also read this somewhere that there's an old like saying in the in the war. I don't know if it was like samurais who believed in it. Or there were some type of warriors who believed that every 100 years, like a great warrior, a gladiator's soul is like almost like passed on or reincarnated. So to to the date, like the pictures that I showed you was exactly one hundred. It was like similar, apart. yeah. Yeah, exactly one hundred <laughs> years apart, and like I believe that like whatever his, I don't think I'm like not necessarily a reincarnation, but I think that his fighting soul just was, directed yeah, to you, yeah, yeah. because I because I'm, I'm I'm constantly bringing his name up, you know, I'm trying to fight like him, and I'm trying to do everything the way he did it. So I think if if the if when people die, their energy whatever it goes, I think somehow I got a hold. Hundred percent. Yeah. Uh, his favorite fight that you ever watched? Probably the Jess Willard fight. Yeah, that was because to this day it's the most brutal uh, beating in boxing history. Like he he broke his jaw, his eye socket, knocked out six teeth, broke his ribs, and like back then there was no neutral knock knockdown corner rule. So you knock a guy down, you didn't have to go to the neutral corner. Actually, they made that rule because of Jack Dempsey, because he because wow. like. But before him, boxing was the gentleman's sport. You see, like the fighters of this, these old eras, you know, they got their, their dukes like up. Like a some yeah, style, yeah, yeah. yeah. And it was a very like it was a a respected sport. So fighters would they would fight, and like if somebody got knocked down, they would take a step back, and they would out of respect, they'd let the other man back to his feet. Referee would say box, and they would go. But that wasn't a rule. Yeah. Technically, they didn't have to do that. Yeah. So when Dempsey came into the scene, it was the first time the world had seen a fighter not care about this guy like he, he literally you'd hit him and he would drop him and he would stand over him he would actually go around to his back so when the guy got up he hit him from behind again oh wow like you, there's there's no like it's kill or be killed exactly there's like, no going around it no like, <laughs> and, and and i that's why i love that fight because he really showed the world like what it means to be like a ruthless fighter and you know you respect the guy before the fight shake his hand before the fight after the fight but during the fight like it's, it's like no Man, it's better his mother cries than my mom. Yeah, you recently were in New York as well for his 100th anniversary versus, uh, was it Furpo, I believe? Yeah. How was that whole, like, New York City vibe going there, especially for Jack Dempsey? I really felt like uh, he was with me everywhere I went. Like, the, everybody was talking about him. I ended up, like, being going to his, uh, not his original restaurant, but the one that they named after him since in New York got City. shut down. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, they just took the P out of his name, but it's, it's still named after him. Um, you know, got got to uh, talk to a lot of people who like, personally knew him, like uh, Jill Diamond and Dom Majeski, like, you know. We, legends. We, legends. They told so many stories about him. And, and uh, Mauricio Solomon himself actually asked if he could call me Jack. So that's what he calls me. He Incredible. Call me <laughs> Incredible. Wow. Does he have, like, uh, kids and stuff, Jack Dempsey? Actually, I'm, I'm, I've talked to his grandson quite a bit. I was going to say, Josh yeah. Dempsey, yeah. He, wow. he owns a gym in uh, Miami called... Uh, I think it's Dempsey's Lions. You ever go there? No, but I got to go. for I'll sure. Going, Especially yeah. you go with the straps, you got to go there for yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Oh, 100%. He, he's been following my career, actually, before I even knew who he was. What? Yeah, I didn't that, even know that's that. Just in, that's incredible. I got to ask now, what got you into boxing? Um, for, for me, it was, like, I was, I was just, a, I grew up in a fighting family, so I was, I was always involved in street fights, and then uh, once, once I got to around ages, like, 14, 15, that was when I started, like, they started going from, like, giving people black eyes and 
bloody noses in fights <laughs> or getting a tooth knocked out to like I would like break people's jaws and like <laughs> and it, was, it got bad so I started getting like charged by the police getting locked up and I think it was like my third um, my third assault charge it was like assault causing bodily harm and uh, I had like an option to I think it was part of one part of my conditions you know you get like probation sentence one of my conditions was to join a sport it was either like complete uh, restorative justice and, and do the conditions and basically stay out of trouble for 12 months or I was going to go to like juvie and so obviously I went with the probation and I had to join a sport as part of the conditions so I want to join hockey my dad's like well you're just going to get kicked out of hockey like you're, you're going to slide you're going to be slugging your best there for sure so he put me in a, a local boxing club and then like as soon as I started boxing like fell in love yeah I sucked at it to be honest with you I couldn't I, even to this day I'm not that great of a boxer I just kind of like slug it out like I said I started boxing for, uh, I think it was about 15 years old and uh, I was fighting amateur. I only had two amateur fights, but I was still street fighting. Mm -hmm. Like you could, you couldn't keep me at yeah, trouble. No way, yeah, there's no way. No, and 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 at that time I was like, damn. Now that I know how to, to box a little bit, I want to fight even more in the streets. I used to actually have this like red Sydney boxing club jacket, and I used to carry on my mouth guard. So, so you're like ready to go at, at any time. Always, and I just <laughs> as soon as it's something would break out, I put my mouthpiece in. And I'm like, okay, I'm gonna work on my boxing yeah. now. Right and in the street. Wow, that's, this yeah. is crazy. But that that ended up getting me in more trouble. I ended up getting charged again. And then uh, I, I ended up like charged again and again, and like my uh, boxing coach was a correctional officer, and he knew what was going on. Like I come into the gym every weekend with a black eye, yes, with stitches. Like, What's going on? And, and he's like, "Man, are you gonna stay at it? Like, you're gonna, you gonna?" He's like, "You can actually do something in boxing. Just stop coming here with like beat up, getting into yeah, the street fights." Yeah, I didn't listen, and then eventually he had no choice but to uh, suspend me from boxing. So I got my amateur license pulled for two years so I didn't I couldn't box from ages like 15 to 17 and uh, I got my my license pulled and during those two years I went from like 160 pounds to 200 pounds and I had about 200 street fights in the process oh. <laughs> so when I, when I came back to boxing at 17 I was still amateur uh, I started fighting all the super heavyweights around uh, Nova Scotia and inside Canada and I started like knocking people out and then yeah that that was like my amateur career, but then once um, once I started fighting like the elites of Canada, then I started to lose because my brawling style just didn't it didn't match up for the amateur style, yeah. right? Who was your toughest opponent to date? If you could think of some of that you fought throughout, not even your amateurs, like pro. You know, I, I it's I'll, you'd, you'd like to say Revis because that was yeah, such a that was a slugfest. It was a slugfest, but the, my toughest opponent would have actually been sounds weird because it only went two rounds. I knocked him out, but uh, it was a guy named Kateg Pliev. He was uh, from Dagestan, Russia, and it was my 11th pro fight, I think. And he was 5-0 and undefeated as a boxer, but we didn't know much about him. And like a week before the fight, I started finding stuff out about this guy. Number one, he's from Dagestan. Yeah, so it's like, all no, I do is fight probably, yes, for sure. Number two, Anderson Silva, um, Junior Dos Santos, the Noguera brothers, Noguera. all had hired him to be in camp to train with him. Wow. And I was like, why are they hiring? Yeah, why they hiring? Something, something sped, like something's going on, yeah. Then I started finding out he was undefeated in kickboxing. He was on the Russian uh, Olympic wrestling team for 15 years, team captain. What? He was... Um, elite. Elite, and he had knock, He was knocking out dudes in bo like high, high-level professional boxers. He was sparring them and knocking everybody out. So no one... So, like, it was, it was a fight early in my career that was supposed to be a stepping stone fight for me. No, it was, it was like, a tough one. They, I came out, I'll never forget, like, I mean, you can find the fight on YouTube, it's, it's on YouTube, and uh, the first round, the first punch he threw at me, it was the hardest punch I've ever been hit with in my life. You're like, wake up, call like, oh. Buddy, like, <laughs> I've, been, I've been hit with just about anything you can imagine in a street fight, like, I've been hit with baseball bats, crowbars, people have hit me with everything. But that right there. <laughs> this dude hit me harder than anybody ever hit me. And he broke, um, that's why this, I got half an eyebrow missing here. And from that fight? From that fight. Wow. He, he hit me so hard that my whole orbital bone just shattered. Like every that, time I blinked in the fight, I thought there was gravel. When did that happen? Like the first round or when was that? Uh, that happened at the, the beginning of the second round. So, the, so early? The, the first round was like, it was just kind of like we were feeling each other yeah. a little bit. And then the second round, he opened up, crushed my eye socket, opened a cut up over my eye, needed like 30 some stitches inside and out. And I went completely blind in this eye, and then the blood was going into this eye too, so I couldn't really see. All I could see was like, like shadows and stuff. But um, I was, I could hear my coach was just scree Stevie screaming, yeah. like, "You got to knock him out now! If you got it, then you do it now, do right?" It now. Exactly. But, but this guy's coming to kill me because yeah. 
because he's seen his chance to take an undefeated fighter out. Yeah. So he's coming at me, and, and I remember just like, boom, like that was the first time that uh, the, the bruiser ever came out. Came out, yeah. yeah. It's like, come to unleash him now. I did, and it was just a blur from there, yeah. Like, what separates you now from other fighters? Number one, that. That, yeah. That's, that's right there, say. yeah. It, uh, it came out in the green fight, too. You know, it came out in the Rebus fight. Um, I had another fight against uh, former Canadian champion, Silvera Lewis. Like, this is something I have that, that I was, I don't know if I was born with it or if it came from being in so many, like, kill or be killed moments in streets. A um, couple, couple times in street fights, like, early, early on in life, uh, I was in, like, situations where if, if I didn't fight back, these, these dudes were going to kill me, right? Like, yeah. I remember being on the pavement, getting my head stomped, and I'm like, well, I'll find a way up. Like, I'm, these guys are going to kill me. So I think it, like, uh, triggers some sort of, like, this ability to, like, use my rage to just, like... Get, get up. Yeah, yeah. just get up, and, and it, it comes out in boxing fights sometimes. Yeah. But the problem with that is, like, um, I had one fight against a guy from Argentina who was just, like, an elite, elite skilled boxer who you know that it didn't work because he wasn't there like if you're going to stand in front of me yeah and if i snap the fight's over done yeah i don't care who you are the the you're not dealing with it i'm gonna say now we let's bring it back to we said steve bailey what does steve bailey mean to you uh you know he's a, he's a, to me he's like a he's not just a coach he's like a like a brother like a in a way like a father figure like a a mentor Fucking psychologist. <laughs> yeah, so you, you can talk to him about anything. <laughs> yeah, like like this this stuff I talk about the rage and all yeah. that. Like this guy knows how to talk to me. He knows what to say. To like, I come into the gym like I I have to apologize to everybody after fights because um, during like fight week, I don't mean to, but like I'm very like quick tempered. Yeah. So like little things can set me off. Like if you ask me like why you why you got your hand wraps that color. I'll be like, well, Snap. what does it matter? Like, we're, I'm fighting to the death on Saturday. Yeah. Who cares about my freaking hand wraps? Yeah. You know what I mean? So, like, so Stevie will, like, t take me, like, kind of take me to the other side of the gym and we'll and talk. talk it all, yeah. We'll talk through it. And, he, and he, he just knows, like, he won't tell me, you know, you can't be like this. He'll just be like, he'll, he'll work with it. He yeah, knows exactly. how to, like, how to guide it to the right place. This emotions, these, you know, this rage that I have, like, he'll just guide it into the right place. We're using it Saturday, so, you know. He speaks very highly of you. Yeah, he, and he obviously, even he was telling me today, like, you have to start believing that you're one of the best fighters, if not the best fighter in the world. And I'm like, that's you crazy bastard. Yeah. Like, <laughs> like, you can't get more motivated than that. I'm like, come sure. on, buddy. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm good, but I don't know about that. Like, yeah. I, I get I'm a good fighter, but that's But people that's see crazy. it, hey, you're number one for a reason. I mean, yeah, but, it's, but to me, you know, it's still just a number on a paper. Mm -hmm. and, and I believe that any... Any fighter on any given night can, can beat any other fighter on any given night. You know what I mean? Like So anything's possible once you're in there. Dirt all might knock me out in the first round. Like it's it's a possibility. Oh no, obviously not. <laughs> you know, but it might happen and, and like I didn't believe if you get delu like a lot of fighters the problem with, with uh with fighters is they get delusional. They start to believe their own hype. They they start to listen to the media too much. They start to watch their own videos on Instagram too much. Because we don't forget this stuff is all chopped up and edited. Like, of course. Do you know what I mean? The like, best ten seconds out of like that whole hour, basically. Yeah, it's not yeah. real. It's not real. All this stuff you're watching is not real. What What does Ryan like to do on his spare time? Uh, hunt. Hunt. <laughs> yeah, like I'm, I cannot wait to get home to get some hunting in. That's like your passion. Yeah, I freaking love it. I like, just like to eat what I kill and <laughs> kill what I eat. <laughs> exactly. They're like, how important is nutrition and diet for you? Uh, it's huge. Like for me, I, I try to. I stay like. I don't even diet really. It's a lifestyle. All year round, I'm, I'm eating healthy. Like yeah, at the time I'll eat the chicken wings or something, but like very rarely. And, and if I'm home, I'm only eating what I kill. Exactly. But not in Toronto because I'm not gonna eat what's here. To be honest. Yeah. Like, no, no offense, <laughs> but I don't know what the deer are eating here. Yeah, I don't exactly. want to eat them. What do you hunt? Like what is like? I guess deer. Like what? Like what's your favorite meat? When you like bear. Bear. Yeah. No way. Yeah. At least Any I'm... crazy stories with that? Like a bear? Wow. I killed like one of the biggest bears ever shot in Cape Breton. What? Yeah, it's on my Instagram. If you find it, there's a picture of it on there. And how big was this? Like we're talking. Like oh, it was massive. It was, like, <laughs> it was absolutely massive. Like it was a black bear, but when I when I brought so to me, I just eat for the meat. Like I don't really care about trophies, but because this was like the first bear I'd ever actually shot, um, I wanted to get the the rug done. Yeah, I for sure. I can imagine. Yes, I wanted for sure. to have something to save. So first and foremost, I I butchered it. I used all the fat, rendered it down for cooking oil. Then I cut up all the meat, vacuum sealed it, roast steaks, everything, all that. And then uh, I took the hide into uh, the Valley Taxidermy in, to in Nova Scotia. And when I brought it into him, he, he couldn't believe it. He's like, I gotta show you something. 
and he showed me a grizzly bear that someone had brought in yeah. Cape Town that they shot in over in Alaska or someplace, right? And my bear was the same size as the grizzly bear, a black bear. And black bears are not, they're supposed to be small. So you got like the big beast. He was a monster. Like, this bear was eating other bears. <laughs> like a boxing fight. After a boxing fight, the Revis was a rough one. Like Steve would tell you the story. Uh, if, he, is he, if he's ever interviewed about it, so he was the only one that was, was uh, on the hospital trip there. So people see me at the af afterwards. Exactly. But um, on the way to the, to the hospital, it was some scary moments. Like my, my I was having kidney failure. My what? brain was swollen. From that fight? Oh yeah, like there was debate about like taking off a piece of my skull, I'm pretty sure, because my brain was completely swollen. Like, oh yeah, and, and uh, my muscles were shutting down. They had to give me morphine to like even get an IV in me because my body was like convulsing and stuff. I don't remember any of this. Yeah, either. exactly. Wow, no. that's incredible. When I started coming around, that like Stevie, I just remember the first thing I remember after that fight. I remember leaving the ring, and then I remember being in the dressing room. I remember, I actually remember Arthur Betterbeef being in my dressing room, telling me how great of a warrior I was. Madness, know? yeah, crazy. And uh, and then next thing you know, I was just like waking up, and uh, Stevie had his hand on my shoulder, and I was just like, whoa, kind of like, what's going on? Right? <laughs> IV was like, there's blood everywhere because they couldn't get the IV in because like my body was convulsing and stuff. And then he's just like, you're good, buddy, you're going to be good. And I was like, all right, I thought I was gone there for a minute. But this happened a couple times what? after fights. It happened after uh, the Peralta fight. I had a seizure and all this From stuff. From fighting? Oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Is that because, like, the shots to the head, Shots I guess? to the head, swollen brain, no oxygen getting to your brain. Yeah, yeah. My career was supposed to be over multiple times. And now you're here. They don't call you the bruiser for no reason. No, I just keep getting, I honestly keep getting stronger. And, like, the more I get hit, I seem like the more witty I actually get. It's like the opposite. Modern day Jack Dempsey. Yeah, this, is, <laughs> this is incredible. I'll, I'll say, how do you uh, how do you handle like the pressure, the expectation of being just like a professional boxer and athlete? Although I, I'm a professional now, I have to kind of carry myself a little bit differently. But I, I just see it like I'm a modern day gladiator. You know, if, if you put me two thousand years ago, I would be in a coliseum with a sword fighting a lion. I really would. You yeah, know, if it was a hundred years ago, I was Jack Dempsey. You know, fifty years before that, I was John L. Sullivan. You know, a hundred years from now, when I'm long gone dead, I'm fighting robots. <laughs> you're you're made for this for sure. Yeah. What goes through your mind, like just before the fight, like say, like right to like so Ryan, like you're just about to go right through it, just into the ring. What goes through your mind? I'm kill this man, and, and I'm ready to die to kill him. Where's your favorite uh, like place to fight at? Is it in, back home in Nova Scotia? Yeah, I would say it's in Cape Breton. My huh? my favorite place to fight is Cape Breton. The like where I grow up, like it's it's a different kind of area. People there are just. Uh, Fighting is life for a lot of people. That's exactly. all people talk about. You go to a bar, like they're looking at your knuckles to exactly. make sure that you're hardened. You know, when somebody shakes your hand, they're looking at your hands to oh, see hard, you're firm, how yeah. many fights you've been in. Look, they're looking at your face, how many scars you got. Nobody cares how much money you have. Exactly. No one cares what you drive. No they one want cares if you have wearing. enough balls, basically. <laughs> yeah, they want to know. Yeah, yeah if, you're, if you're a fighter or not. Uh, so how how Cape Britain and stuff like what's the population? Is it quite big or everybody knows everybody? Everyone knows everybody. Listen, how was it growing up in uh, Cape Breton? Uh, it was, it's rough. Like you, you got to, um, you know, back then I had to I had to work growing up. So for me, I grew up um, on my grandfather's farm for the most part. Well, I started in a trailer court. I went from the trailer court to the farm. And then once I got on the farm, it was like my job was to get the wood in the basement for the winter, fill up the shacks for the winter, and like cut hardwood. And it's cold. Exactly. So some real started from the bottom type of stuff. Yeah, there, right? like yeah. I was cutting wood for you know 365 days a year when I was 11 years old. You see yourself accomplishing now, like in the next, let's say, two to five years. You know, if I can get that world title, like I'm so close. Really, I'm two punches away. 100%. You know, it's right there. And then you know, hey, but anything can happen. Like I could lose Saturday night, and I'm back down. To bottom of the ladder here so I don't want to get ahead of myself I don't want to look past Saturday but let's say if I do pull it off and I knock him out uh, I would like to get that world title in a you know in a, in a high hopes world I would like to get that world title and I would like to knock out every man that that uh, stands in the way or comes and challenges for it. Do you think boxing gets that like respect from other sports? Do you think boxing gets the respect that it deserves? I think it's starting to. I yeah. think uh, you know, I think these YouTube guys and the celebrities like messing around and playing around in there and, and uh, you know, manipulating the, the public, I think that kind of gave it a little bit of a bad name. Um, but I think that, I think boxing needs somebody like me to, to and I'm not trying to, you know, sound arrogant or, you know, egotistical or anything, but I really believe that boxing needs someone like me to basically show the world that 
this is a this is like the modern day gladiators. This, this, this is how they're supposed to be. Like yeah, I know exactly. MMA is brutal too. Guys yeah. get their arms snapped and stuff. But boxing, there's more deaths. Yeah. But if you if you want to if you want to risk your life in in uh, combat sports, go to professional boxing. And I and I don't mean celebrity YouTube, yeah. uh, you know, influencer the nonsense stuff. Yeah. stuff. I'm yeah. talking real prize fighting. You know, you you look in club cards. Guys die all the time because it's just pure trauma to the head. Yeah. You you're not in there like. There's no way you can hold and get a break. You can't go to the ground and take a breather. And I'm not knocking MMA. That yeah. That's just as brutal, if not more brutal in its own way. But the box is always right to the, like, to the head. You're to taking, the, yeah. it's just nonstop punishment to the brain, to the body, to the organs. So, like, there's nowhere to go. You, you, get, you get dropped and knocked out. You're back on your feet. There's a referee going to say, box, and this guy's coming to kill you. Again, right away. Oh, right away, oh, like, there's nowhere to go. Yeah, exactly. You know? So, so your life is on the line every time you get in there. It's the, it's the closest thing you can get to like mod, modern day gladiators in a coliseum fighting. So, and I think that the world needs to be reminded of that. And that's what I think I'm here for. Advice for like upcoming fighters that look at you, just in general, just be like, wow, like like they like the path that as a boxer, professional boxer, like you're going to, and they just look at you and stuff, like y the youngins that just wanna need advice. Any advice for the future? You know what, I couldn't give any advice to the, except for the kids that are coming out of freaking juvies and come and, and stuff like that. Like, as real as it gets, yeah. I think that the the, the, ath the athletes, because I'm not, I don't look at myself like an athlete. I don't look at myself like a boxer. I'm like that fighter that got saved by boxing. If it wasn't for boxing, I would have been dead long ago. My whole goal in life was to once I found out that I was a fighter, once I once I learned that this is like the only thing in life I wanted to do, I was just fighting to the death even before I knew what boxing was. You know what I mean? It's just nobody could get me there. Yeah, exactly. Nobody could get me there in the street. So so I started boxing to challenge tougher people to get me there. And then uh so yeah, so if I gotta give advice to these like number one, if if you're if you're not willing to die, don't do it. If you're not willing to die or kill in a fight, Go do something else. Exactly. Go do something else. Like, <laughs> I think that the the ones the fighters that should look up to me or the young kids coming up that should look up to me are the ones coming out of juvies. They're the ones who found boxing. I know you can still do something with your life. Yeah, and yeah. then it can turn violence into something like actually beautiful. Like really, like it's like I took this like violence that was gonna get me killed or kill people in the streets, and I put it into like something to make money and, and uh, inspire other people like me. What is the like most valuable lesson that boxing taught you? Control. Be control because like, you know, e like people piss me off. There's no question. I can about it. I can't <laughs> we live in such a weird world where, where people are just weird and they, 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 they want to like say anything push, stupid. Yeah. They want to just push their stupid beliefs onto everybody. Yeah. And if you don't believe you're you're automatically like you're either a freaking hater or a racist or you're this or, or something. You're, you're something. Something stupid, right? And like these type of people, like, if it wasn't for boxing and they approach me and not not on this stuff in yeah. real life, I real would life. smash their. I can imagine, yeah. Smash their. They just they skulls. were basically tough guys behind the the, the yeah. bigger screen, yeah. That's what, but, what boxing taught me is like, you know, you could have someone come in right now and they could just like completely slander me and go on and this and that, and I'll just be like, yeah, well, I gotta go train. I gotta go train. Another really stuff to do. Yeah, exactly. You know, I got something to prove here a little bit bigger than what you mean. Yeah. But if it wasn't for boxing, yeah. It's like they can't even ago. step into your shoes for not even a second. No, but that's okay. You just it, it, you got to kind of humble yourself and and and, and realize like and, and also it, it's like once you have this ability like it's like not to sound arrogant or nothing, but it's like taking candy from a baby and it's like they don't know. They don't know exactly. It's like when a little kid comes up to you, like a small little child, right, and they punch you. You're not just gonna smash the kid. Exactly. They don't know. They don't know. They like, don't know. They're, they're just know a yet. kid. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, what, what what keeps you motivated? To to. All that. All that, exactly. <laughs> All that. Exactly. exactly. Now, your personal goals in boxing to become world champion? That's the goal? It is right now. Like I said, when I first started, it was just be a prize fighter, you know. Right now, because the world title's right there, it kind of has to be my has goal. It has to be. has to be. has to be my goal. If, I, if it's not, then I'm not going to get it. So I have to focus on that right now. So right now, it's getting that world title. Um, but currently, Duradola, first round. Exactly. How important yeah. is legacy to you? Oh, it's huge. Yeah. It's huge. And like I said, uh, I think that my whole purpose here is to, to show the world what uh, what a prize fighter really is. Not a, not a YouTuber, not somebody no, who pretends. actual fighter. I mean a fighter who boxing exactly. literally saved them, took them from took them from nothing and made them something. And, and that's what I'm here for. What does the sport of boxing like mean to you? We all know it saved your life, literally. Mm -hmm. What does it mean to you, boxing? It, it's like... Boxing's like a gift for people, you know, it's like, um, 
like I said, people like me who were growing up and they, they, they were on this one-way track to self-destruction. Like, if it wasn't for boxing, it, boxing's like a god. Let's put it that way. Yes. It's like a religion. Savior it's, for you. It's yeah. a savior. It's like, um, I, I thank every day. I thank boxing every day. I thank boxing and Jack Dempsey because if it yeah. wasn't for those two things, I wouldn't be here. Like, in the very beginning, there's many other things. There's many other people I'd have to thank and stuff like that. But those are the roots. You know what I, I mean? Got you where you are right now. For sure. What do you see yourself doing after boxing? Damn, I don't know. <laughs> Open your own, like maybe like to train. Would you Would you like to go like step in like how uh, Stevie is? Would you like to train or? I mean, no, I would never be able to train nah, fighters yeah. like Stevie. You're, <laughs> you're like, let's go. You're very ruthless. Don't get scared. <laughs> but no, one day, one day, I definitely like to uh, open up a gym back home in Cape Breton, and because. That, that gym that I started and saved a lot of people like me. It's a rough place, like I said, and uh, a lot of uh, a lot of kids coming up there are going down a one-way track to uh, nowhere. Similar path, yeah. Similar path, and, and there's no gym right now that's like a place for them to go. So wow. I think I, I think once it's all said and done, if I make it out of this alive, then I, I'll, uh, I'll probably, you know, reopen the old club, yeah. And when it's all set and done, what do you want the fans to remember Ryan Rizicki as? The most violent fighter that ever lived. <sighs> Couldn't have said it better. This Saturday, it's live from Sydney, Nova Scotia. The bruiser, Ryan Rizicki, right here versus Duradola. It's going to be an absolute. I hope it's going to be a one, uh, one round knockout for I you. I hope so. Hey, God, it could be a 12 round war. We'll see. Who knows, guys? It could go either way, guys. Yeah. Thanks for tuning in live. It's Johnny I Pro Show with WBC's ranked number one. Watch them live this Saturday. See you later.